Hello, I'm JJ Joaquin, and welcome to Philosophy and What Matters, where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view. Today, we talk about love, the philosophy of love, that is. Now, we all have some notion of what romantic love is. Our guides, perhaps, are the romantic novels of Jane Austen or the latest rom conflicts available on Netflix. These guides give us a heterosexual and monogamous picture of romantic love, happily ever after with a singular person of the opposite sex who, will, who we will love and cherish for the rest of our lives. The morals, however, are changing. We are no longer in the, strict, in the time of strict monogamous heterosexual partnerships that Burton Russell's marriage and morals have put into question. Heck, even the head of the Catholic Church, Pope Francis, has opened the discussions on non-hetero partnerships. Now, but how should we think philosophically about these changing norms about romantic love? Now, joining us to discuss this kind of new philosophy of love and why it matters, we have Carrie Jenkins, Professor of Philosophy and Canada Research Chair at the University of British Columbia and the author of What Love Is and What It Could Be. So hello, Professor Jenkins. Welcome to Philosophy and What Matters. Hi, hi. Thanks for having me. OK, so before getting into our main topic, let's first discuss your philosophical background. How did you get into philosophy? Yeah, um, so I mean, it depends a little bit whether you mean the discipline known as philosophy in formal academic contexts, mm. or when did I start doing the activity? Um, because I think that activity goes back as far as I can remember ever since I was a little kid. Um, I, I have very early memories of thinking about things that, um, that I would now call infinity and infinite regresses and, mm -hmm. and skeptical worries. Um, mm -hmm. But I didn't know it was called philosophy until around about age 17, um, when one of my uh, teachers in, uh, in um, secondary school uh, encouraged me to apply for philosophy undergraduate degree. Um, and then when I realized that's what philosophy is, um, I was hooked and I, I was sort of just um, determined to, to stick with it from that point onward. So very, very early, really, I mean, relative to a lot of other philosophers, I, I decided that, that philosophy was for me. Mm -hmm. So where did you go to your undergraduate? At the University of Cambridge mm -hmm. in England, um, I went to Trinity College in Cambridge, um, and I did, in fact, I did all my degrees there, my uh, um, MPhil and PhD as well. Wow. Then you went to some other universities as well? Um, yep. Then I got my first job at the University of St. Andrews uh, in Scotland, and I've held a few other academic positions in between before landing here in Vancouver. At mm -hmm. the University of British Columbia. Okay, so he, who influenced you to pursue a career in academic philosophy? You know, I, I, I didn't really need any uh, encouragement to <laughs> for undergraduate admissions. And when I went into my interview, I remember one of the last few and I said, I want your job, basically, <laughs> to the person interviewing me. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I, I, I just really wanted to have a, a career and a life that was that revolved around being able to, to think and, uh, and discuss and, um, and write about ideas that seemed intriguing and, and important to me um, mm -hmm. and and this looked like it was a way to do that okay so you're... yeah i don't i i mean i, I yeah i was just <laughs> i was so determined from that early stage that um any other outside influences were merely peripheral <laughs> okay so you you are working on metaphysics stuff you're working on epistemology analytic philosophy in general but what led you to the philosophy of love that is the philosophy uh, of romantic love. Um, the philosophy of, of love came about as um, a kind of confluence of my interests in, in 
especially metaphysics and questions like what's real and what isn't, what's natural versus socially constructed or even fictitious, you know, projection from our minds, maybe. Um, and so that, there was that kind of general interest and things I was already working on in uh, more, more standard areas of analytic metaphysics. And then uh, um, in my personal life, um, and I've started using the slogan now, the personal is metaphysical. Um, <laughs> I, I was in a, <laughs> I was in a non uh, standard relationship uh, myself. Mm. I'm in a non monogamous um, marriage now. And uh, I started hearing comments like, well, that's not real love. You know, that's um, real mm. love is, is you'd only have eyes for one person. You wouldn't feel that way about anyone else. Um, so being, you know, the kind of, thinker that I am, I was like, well, that's an interesting claim. I wonder if it's true. <laughs> um, you know, I was also deeply offended and hurt, but I was also, I also wanted to know if that's true. Is this, does it mean it's not, you're not really in love with someone if you're mm. also in love with someone else? And so that question um, basically became the book, that this, this book, What Love Is and What It Could Be. Um, uh, of course, it got expanded with a lot more, um, you know, questions that didn't come so directly out of my personal experience about well, what what love, um, what romantic love um, mm. really is, and how it's kind of um, how it's been theorized not just by philosophers um, but by uh, human beings in general. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let, let's get into your book. Let's discuss some details of your book. In particular, you discuss the biological and sociological aspects of love. So could you give us a picture of what these aspects are and what ultimately is your view about romantic love? Yeah, of course. Um, so I went into this when I saw I was sort of interested in what human beings in general think about love. Part of my um, agenda, I suppose, there is to try and mend a divide between scientific and maybe broadly humanistic ways of mm. understanding what love is and specifically romantic love um because you i was seeing a lot of these sort of back and forth conversations about versus evolutionary history and social programming. Um, mm. And that to me just felt too simplistic. And it was as if there was this sort of competitive um, situation where one side had to win and mm -hmm. say that the other side was just stupid about it. Like, so, so the, you know, the scientists would say, oh, you're just so, you're just a science denier. You can't appreciate the, you know, the real chemistry and the real sort of um, uh, evolutionary background. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other side, you get the, the humanists sort of saying, no, you're just sociopolitically naive um, and you haven't taken into account all of these biases and prejudices that, that everybody has. Um, and so what, what, I, what I ended up thinking was that um, these are really not, in fact, um, stories that need to be in competition with one another. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, of course we are you know, we exist in these neat bodies made out of um, <laughs> bits mm. of, of stuff and they've evolved uh, to be a certain way. Um, and, and also we are embedded in um, potent social contexts that influence everything that we experience and everything that we do. Um, and so I think the best questions uh, for uh, philosophical uh, purposes arise at the intersection mm -hmm. of the uh, scientific approaches and um, these more humanistic or sociological approaches to what love is. So, so questions like how do the, the biological and the social connect around this topic um, and what's coming from where? Um, mm -hmm. So um, just to give you my very, a very, very quick answer, <laughs> um, the, the, what I go for in this book is a form of a uh, functionalist view um, mm. and the way that I explain it, um, trying to make it kind of as comprehensible as I can uh, outside of philosophical contexts. Um, I mean, outside of co context of formal academic philosophy, the way mm. that I explain it is to say that it's, it's as if there's a, um, a kind of role or, um, you know, like a script, a role for a, a person in a movie or a TV show. Um, and that's the romantic love role. And then we cast the biological machinery that we actually have with its 
long evolutionary history, we cast it in that role. Mm -hmm. And we say, how well does it play the role? Does it fit? Is this a good fit? Is it a good casting decision to have mm -hmm. this kind of biology try to play this kind of social role determined mm -hmm. by things like usually monogamy, usually heterosexuality, the expectation that it will last forever and form a family around it. And also the reproductive unit and all of those pieces that define the role. Um, so that's, the, that's what I try to suggest as the connection between the two. Um, and then I, I get into a little bit into some of these questions about, so then what is, um, what is coming to us from the biological side of it? Um, mm. And this is where I would engage with questions like, is monogamy natural um, or is non-monogamy natural? Um, both of these are claims that, that um, have been defended um, at mm -hmm. various times by different people with different purposes. Um, my, my answer to those kinds of questions is usually um, yes and yes. So <laughs> one of the analogies that I end up drawing is, so I say, look, humans are naturally a very diverse species, right? The all thing right. that we do very, very well is adapt and try all kinds of different strategies to surviving and cooperating operating in, uh, in our mm. environment. So I say it's like, it's a bit like asking whether having blue eyes is natural or whether brown is the natural color for eyes. Mm. It's like, well, <laughs> the, the both, they're both <laughs> perfectly <laughs> natural. <laughs> they both yeah. happen and they're both just different ways of sort of adapting an eye to try to solve a problem of how to mm. process light. Mm. Um, and monogamy and non-monogamous configurations are just different ways of, of trying to solve a problem of how to cooperate socially into small units often um, involved in the, the formation of, of um, close adult bonds and or child rearing and um, things like mm. that so these are just different strategies both of which are natural um, and i think a lot of other a lot of other um, questions can be answered in similar spirits uh, about what's what's natural and what isn't mm. um, that doesn't necessarily solve the problem of what exactly counts as romantic love and what doesn't, but right. um, <laughs> that's where things like my thought experiments start to come in. Right, so before we, before we get into the thought experiments, let me try to get a handle of your main position. So mm -hmm. here are two stories about love. You have the purely biological scientific story that we reduce love in terms of what's going on in the brain, perhaps. And here's another story, the humanistic story or the sociological story that tells you that love is just, you know, socially constructed, something that's brought about by our social interactions, expectations in society. So what your project is trying to do is to, well, reconcile these two things and say that, well, both are true pictures of what's going on, but the interesting questions are the intersection between the two. So for example, yeah. whether heterosexual relationships are natural so that's a kind of uh, thing that you could work on or yeah your your project of whether monogamy is also something natural or non-monogamy is something natural i wonder though if this kind of picture is accepted by many <laughs> scholars right now <laughs> i mean T to be fair, I don't think it's exactly not accepted. Mm -hmm. It's more that the question is not really raised this way. Um, mm. So especially like a lot of philosophers who are working on love, um, they're not quite asking that metaphysical question or that kind of metaphysical question. Um, a lot of the work um, that had been done when I was sort of getting into this stuff, so the book's a few years old now and this is gradually changing over time, but the, a lot of the work that had been done was um, sort of started from the assumption of permanent monogamous hetero mm. romantic relationship and then kind of worked from there and asked questions like is it rational to to pick one person is it rational mm. to love that one person is, are there reasons for loving someone or is it just you just you know love the person regardless of their features and qualities mm. um, and these kinds of questions and then you get into issues like the the so-called trading up problem so if you love someone for their qualities what if someone else comes along and has those <laughs> qualities so great right <laughs> all of this kind of stuff and it's all so this is, on the yeah this one is the robert nozick harry Frankfurt literature right 
Exactly. Yeah. Right, so, right. so Nozick uh, had his own contribution, but this is um, very much a sort of continuous tradition through the the nineties and the two thousands. Mm. Um, and um, you know, it, 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 it is these are really good questions. Right. And the rationality of love is fascinating to me, um, but they're not going to really um, address what I thought was maybe more urgent for some of these broader uh, social and socio-political conversations, mm -hmm. um, especially witnessing, you know, in the course of my lifetime, just such a massive, massive change in the um, social acceptability of queer relationships right. from, you know, going through teenage, my teenage experience, they were completely rejected and it was absolutely, you know, social death. <laughs> to admit that you were not 100% straight mm -hmm. to, you know, my life now where I can be an openly queer woman, bisexual woman in Vancouver, in Canada, that's mm -hmm. fine. <laughs> that's, not even a, <laughs> that's not even a big deal most right, of the time, right? right? And I know it's not like that all over the world, of course, and plenty of places, it's still a lot like it was 30 years ago, but... Um, here at least that has radically radically changed um and my so my um experience of that shift has has really kind of and i i, you know, I think a lot of people have seen something similar um over our lifetimes it really kind of puts the pressure on to explain from a philosophical point of view well what the heck is going on there were we mm. all just really wrong about love <laughs> <laughs> that we changed our minds um and how does that happen? And, and mm. none of these questions about reasons and rationality of choosing one, one partner rather than another are, are addressing, you know, th those kinds of issues. So, so this is, it's really not that people don't have that view. I think it's more just like no one's really asking that question <laughs> uh, or not in quite that kind of way and for quite these kinds of reasons. So there's this sort of, um, the book has a, it sort of sits at the intersection of, of, um, metaphysics and um, I guess broadly social, socio-political philosophy and some ethics in there, some feminist philosophy, mm. um, things like that. Um, and so I'm my, my, one of my hopes is that the book is able to, to move in the world in a way that speaks metaphysics to those other questions in a way that can be useful. <laughs> that makes sense <laughs> yeah i like that picture because i'm into metaphysics as well so i'm interested in social reality social ontology and your mm -hmm. book is actually an interesting book because as you have said you're putting forward a, a, a different question different sets of questions and also you're put uh, you're putting forward a functionalist story here yeah. now what what is this functionalist story and how does it connect with your thought experiments the alien love thought experiment in the 19th century lesbian love because those are really interesting uh, thought experiments what's the what's the intuition you're trying to pump here good yeah so i mean these these thought experiments and and my the, the kind of functionalism that i'm that i'm appealing to are very kind of standard fare for 20th century analytic metaphysics right so the <laughs> functionalist idea that there's a difference between the role and the realizer for the role been a you know an approach to philosophy of mind and some other things for <laughs> decades right and and i'm just borrowing from their playbook to a large extent oh um, wait, wait wait before that because you were in mm -hmm. at the australian national university right i was yeah, yeah I, did a, so. I did a little stint there for a year yeah i was also there and i wonder if the canberra plan has something some oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I, yeah, yeah. Right. There's, there's, um, so, I mean, if you if you kind of look under the, the metaphysical hood here, what's going on is, is very close to um, the Canberra two-stage thing where mm. you identify the role, you take the Ramsey sentences or whatever, mm. <laughs> of the, <laughs> the, the classic platitudes. Mm -hmm. um, and the platitudes in my case will be things like, you know, what love is, is, so and so and so and so sitting in a tree, K I S S I N G. <laughs> then uh -huh. comes marriage, then comes baby in a baby carriage. Well, what's the thing that comes after kissing but before marriage and the baby? Right? It's that, that's the love. Mm -hmm. um, so it's really that kind of functionalist approach that's driving this. Um, and then the thought experiments that I'm using here are just designed to help us um, uh, get a handle on what the role and the realizer are. 
Um, mm. So uh, the the ones that I use, the the alien love. Um, so the aliens, I'm imagining, they live in a socially they're socially organized exactly like we are, and they have, you know, broadly, mostly hetero, mostly monogamous marriage like. Mm -hmm. coupling relationships between the two kinds of aliens and them yeah. you know um but they're they're biologically different from us and they don't share our evolutionary history right? they're made of different stuff um, mm. so so there you i'm trying to say same role different realizers um and then i so i think about the aliens and then i think about these 19th century lesbians who are um they have the same kind of biology and uh, evolutionary history as contemporary humans, but they have very different social scripts for um, what love should look like um, than we do. Mm. Um, so um, they are, for example, um, not even um, openly acknowledging or discussing the possibility of lesbian uh, romantic love. Mm. Um, and so what happens in, you know, you see a lot of letters going back and forth between women of this era, and I'm thinking of like, you know, British upper class women, mostly. <laughs> um, and they're writing these kind of very passionate things and, and they're, uh, they're clearly in very close, loving, in some sense, relationships, very intimate, often sexually intimate as well, um, but they don't call that love or they don't call it being in love mm. um, because being in love is just, you know, what you do with husbands. Mm -hmm. or you know it, 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 <laughs> if you marry for love which you may not you might marry for <laughs> completely different reasons that's its own whole separate thing so my thought is okay so those um 19th century lesbians let's say they're experiencing something that's biologically very similar to what i might experience if i was in love now um but the social role of their love um is completely undefined mm -hmm. um, so they and they have no they have no script for it and so in that case, I want to say same biological realizer, um, different role, or I mean, the role's kind of absent really in, the, mm. in those kinds of cases. Um, so I'm trying to sort of come at the two directions of what the difference is between the realizer, the biological realizer and the socially constructed role of romantic love. Um, so the aliens, they don't have any of our biology, let's say, but they have, they, they do the role. Right. Uh, the, you know, some <laughs> other thing activates in them that makes them behave that way. The 19th century lesbians, all the biology is going off, but they're not going to couple up and form a family unit and raise children together because the social script in the context is not there. The role is not available for them to enter into, despite in every other way fulfilling the biological requirements for doing that. Mm -hmm. um, so then, I mean, having pointed out the difference between the role and the realized, but like every functionalist, I have to answer the question of which one really mm. is love, right? <laughs> which one is it really? Is it, the, is it the biology or the social stuff? Um, just like functionalists about the mind, right? They have to say, well, it's it's really the functional role and it's not the actual, it's not the realized. Mm -hmm. oh, an unusual kind of functionalist. But what I do is is a little unusual here in that I say, no, it's, um, it's much more messy than that. Mm -hmm. um, something like romantic love, um, there's just too much indeterminacy around. Um, and with something like this, I think it's just not a fruitful way of proceeding to try to must pin down the analysis kind of, um, <laughs> that kind of attitude. Uh, one of the um, images I use in the book is saying, look, if you're trying to define romantic love with precision, it's like you're trying to nail some jello to a wall <laughs> <laughs> but the wall is also made of jello and by the way you also have a jello nail right <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's not going to happen and so the um the useful and the productive philosophical conversations at that point i think have to move beyond the question of uh, so is it really the biology or the social role mm. it's it's no, it's, it's really both. They're, they're both happening. This is the connection between them. Now let's get to the, the questions about what is possible mm. from there. What have we done? What have we made out of what we were given? <laughs> and mm -hmm. could we change it if we wanted to? Yeah, I can't help but see the connection with your thought experiments with David Lewis's mad pain, Martian pain. Exactly. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. It's very, very similar kind of stepping 
stepping through these very similar kinds of arguments. Sort of. Yeah, but, but your conclusion is that, okay, so it's not purely biological. It's not purely sociological. So, but mm -hmm. those two things are there. So, yeah. so can I push you further? So what is romantic love for you, really? As your ti the title of your book suggests, what love is. So what is, what lo what is love? For you. So I mean, <laughs> I, I, I end up saying I have a dual nature account, right? So there's right. The, the social nature, there's the biological nature. They're not unconnected. They, they certainly influence one another back and forth. Um, mm. So, you know, what, um, what we're able to do in our social contexts has an impact on us biologically. It, it, it literally is going to shape our, our um, brain, reinforcing certain connections um, and um, certainly changing things like um, you know, our, our, we change our, our physical bodies in response to our environments. Mm -hmm. um, and on the other hand, of course, we are also uh, constrained in certain ways by our physical uh, nature, our embodiment, um, and uh, certain kinds of, of change that we might say, we might like to see, um, it's gonna be very difficult for us to achieve given the kinds of beings that we are physically, mm -hmm. biologically. Um, and so, I mean, it's, it's, as for what love is, it's, I mean, I, I don't give an answer that looks like what analytic philosophers like to see. There's no necessary interpretation. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Nothing like that. Um, uh -huh. the, the most you can get out of me is I'll say there's the, there's a dual nature theory, but it's mm. not really a definition. Um, and it's very much a kind of like, mm, this is, this stuff's messy, you know, um, that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of flexibility, not just in how we characterize what what exists now, but also um, in terms of what's possible, what you know, what it could look like in the future. Um, mm. And really, what I'm trying to do is more than answer the question of what exactly is it. Um, I'm much more interested in opening up the you know the subtitle part of the book. What could it be? Um, Partly because I think we're ready to ask that question now. <laughs> I think that the, <laughs> the mass, of, I don't mean we uh, as well, I mean like humanity um, is, we've just seen a massive shift in cultural, social attitudes towards right. love, right? right? Around right. particularly queer love. You know, the US made same sex marriage legal in every state, you know, um, very recently. Mm -hmm. comparatively speaking like it, it, given uh, but but quite that change was quite rapid the attitudinal social change is quite rapid um and that's the u.s being positioned the way it is uh it, it, it's very uh, globally influential that that mm -hmm. change happened there um and it's not unrelated to what's going on in other parts of the world um and i think that given we've seen that shift happen We've seen, I, and I think just going back only a little bit earlier than that, a big shift around um, interracial love relationships happened as well. Um, because, you know, it was only a few generations ago that uh, it was illegal for uh, a black person and a white person to get married in the US, right? Um, oh, so oh, this, yeah. is, this is not out of, out of all kind of living memory. Um, and it was just kind of off the table that that could be real love. Right <laughs> now, um, so we've, we've, we've kind of seen two really dramatic shifts in quick succession in our conception of what traditional or real or, you know, genuine romantic yeah. love can be. Um, and I think that that just sets us up to ask about the rest of it, right? <laughs> so, okay, <laughs> this, part, this part's negotiable. We didn't think it was, but it is. This part's negotiable. Two, we didn't think it was, but it is. What else? And and you know, the answer is not, I think, literally everything, mm -hmm. um, because we are, as I said, you know, we're we're animals. We have, um, we're embodied animals. Mm -hmm. We have certain kinds of things that happen to us as such. Um, but maybe more than we might have thought is questionable. And um, there's a, I think it's not coincidental that there's an, a big kind of uptick in interest in mm -hmm. things like non-monogamy at the moment, um, because people are starting to ask those questions about what else is, is possible. Um, and, you know, I, I, 
all my training in philosopher in in, uh, in analytic philosophy as a metaphysician has prepared me to answer questions about modality. <laughs> Okay, let, let's, let's go there. To these questions. All right, let's yeah. go there. Your, the subtitle of your book, as you have said, is What Love Could Be. Now, first question, are you referring here to a kind of metaphysical possibility or what kind of possibility are we talking about? Yeah, um, I mean, it, it is metaphysical possibility and it's driven by the metaphysical theory that underpins the book. Mm. Um, I'm most interested in which ones are like live possibilities, not okay. just pure metaphysical possibilities. If they were very distant and, and you know, um, unfeasible, they would be less interesting. So I'm more interested right now in kind of what could we do going forward? So one of the things I say is that because a big part of our current conception of romantic love is the socially constructed, mm -hmm. scripted element, we have a lot of responsibility for that. Right. We have a lot of power over that part of it. Um, not, you know, not to say that we can just like ditch what we have and change it completely, but we, we do have, we collectively, like everybody, <laughs> everybody <laughs> acting together has quite a lot of control over the social mm -hmm. side of this. Um, and that, that's a, that power um, to, to affect different possibilities comes with responsibility to, to choose wisely <laughs> and mm -hmm. to, to, to exert influence in a direction that we would actually like to see change happen. Um, and um, when I talk about what love could be, I'm often talking about um, what, what kinds of change to the, to the social script, which are usually social constraints, what kinds of changes to those constraints are possible and how would we make them? What would it take to change? Mm -hmm our picture of love. And I think, you know, that question is largely answered by, by looking back to what did it take to change our picture of love over the last 20, 50, 100 years into what it is now. Um, and I talk about things like the role of popular media and right. depictions in, as you say, the, the rom-coms and <laughs> the Jane Austen novels. And mm. All of these, these social, these cultural products, they've always been playing that role. Us, mm. reflecting back what we have now but also helping to generate what it, what love will be for the next generation of consumers of these products um, and it's not just like high art it's also you know what do we teach children on the mm. playground what rhymes mm. are they teaching each other mm -hmm. um, because you know they they that's <laughs> the basic they training, are really right. that's basic training right. I, I wasn't kidding when i said that rhyme about you know, so and so and so and so sitting in a tree. <laughs> it's really that is a theory of love. I mean, right. it's just, and, and and kids learn it so early um, mm. that it's gotten in there really before they have any bullshit detectors. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right. They, they haven't gotten their critical thinking on board yet. You know, mm. brains are not our brains are not really fully developed until we are, you know, much older than that. I think like mm. into our twenties or something. <laughs> 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 Uh, certainly not when you're five years old and playing, um, skipping, uh, jumping rope games um, with other kids and saying these these rhymes. So, um, so um, what's possible is is largely uh, on the social side. What's possible is largely a matter of how can we change stories mm -hmm. what, uh, or tell more stories, right? Because it's not like I want to stop telling the boy meets girl story. Story, that's a great story but there are lots of other good stories as well mm, right, <laughs> um, if we can right. sort of expand our our repertoire of what love stories can look like um, that's a way of releasing some of the constraints that we've currently put in place um, the other thing i'm super fascinated by is what we can do by way of intervention on the biological side yeah i'm interested there as well <laughs> Yeah, right. There's this tendency to think, well, something's biological or natural. That means we're just stuck with it forever. Mm. But of course, we don't really think that's true about, you know, cancer or COVID. We're going to try to cure them or find mm. vaccines, right? We, we, we try to change what's biologically the case for us right now um, by intervening. Um, and um, this is also true for love. And the, there are, uh, there's a long history, some of which I get into, um, some of it's kind of weird um, <laughs> of, of thinking about love as a very much an embodied physical thing that right. you can intervene, intervene medically even with. Mm -hmm. so you can give people you know cures or 
potions to induce love. Mm. Um, and, um, <laughs> You know the the history of that's a little dicey sometimes <laughs> sometimes <laughs> people recommend onions or you know um, <laughs> right <laughs> aphrodisiacs the, 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 the aphrodisiacs are i mean that there's a long the long and um and very dubious tradition of trying to to intervene in our bi like right, our biology right, in ways right. that would affect whether we love someone or not. Uh, but mm. the thing is, now that we have a a little bit more of a grip on what's going on in there, right? Um, uh, we actually have some not you know like fully worked out an ideal science of love, but we have mm. some idea of what kinds of neurochemistry are involved, right, right. which areas of the brain are implicated. Um, mm we actually do realistically have a shot at intervening at this point. Um, and so uh, there's um, some really interesting work being done by a guy called um, uh, Brian Earp, who's uh, working on love drugs and mm. um, thinking <laughs> about these questions, not, not only uh, drugs to sort of switch love on, but also to switch it off. So what if you've been in um, an abusive relationship but you still feel, you know, you still feel your feelings about this person and it's making it hard for you to leave. Mm -hmm. um, would you take a pill to yeah, fall out of love with them, right? Um, so these are, I mean, these are not trivial questions. Um, there's a lot of complexity to, um, even to how to frame them exactly and who should be making those kinds of decisions. Um, but these, these, what I'm really, what I'm trying to get, out here it's a very long-winded way of saying it. it's not only the social aspect that we might be able to change we, mm. we also have some questions to ask and i think it's time to start asking them responsibly <laughs> about how how and when and whether we would want to intervene on the biology of love as well the, the neurochemistry the physical embodied experience of, mm. of being in love or um you know being hurt in love or disappointed in no, that's interesting because I'm thinking like you could transform some person to have a kind of monogamous relationship. So transformations, physical transformations. But now you're talking about brain chemistry. So I could make someone fall in love with me or I could have someone fall out of love of me. Yeah, maybe, so. I mean, so maybe, maybe it's it's. This is why I say it gets it gets very much more complicated very mm. quickly because if you think about well you give someone the so let's say you know you get a stranger in a room and you give them supposing we and we to be clear we don't have this yet but it, <laughs> right it could be <laughs> we have some of the we have some of the kinds of things that it would probably take to make something a bit like this mm. um, so you get them in the room and then um, then you give them certain kinds of drugs and it makes them let's say it just raises the chance it makes them a lot more likely. Mm -hmm. to have the kind of experience that we later would describe as falling in love, right? Mm. Um, now, um, what is missing from that picture would be a lot of the social script, right? So let's say you haven't, you haven't done the, the courtship, right? There's no, there's been no <laughs> conventional dating. There's okay, been, okay. Okay, so, so now what are we going to say about whether that person is in, really in love with you or just brainwashed or you know manipulated mm. in some way um, that's a tricky question for exactly the same reasons as the aliens and the 19th century lesbians mm. right there's there's something that they have some part of it going on and there's something else that's really missing from mm. whatever's going on there um, so it's so it's a really it's a really tricky question not to mention Let's not even start on the ethical implications. Of right, this, right. Just some metaphysics. They're huge. <laughs> just, just even considering the metaphysical question of whether or not that's real love, this is very complicated stuff. Um, and it's so messy. I just, you know, I, I mean, I think, again, we hit the point there where it's like, that's not really a useful question anymore. We have to ask more specific questions about this person's experience and um, how it fits into our. Um, social conception of love, how it fits into mm. biological science. Actually, actually, I'm thinking about uh, you, you explored non-heterosexual and non-monogamous love in your book. But I'm thinking about Muslims and Mormons mm -hmm. who already mm -hmm. practice non-monogamy. Even some ancient cultures permit non-heterosexual partnerships. So are these love relationships in your point of view? 
possibly. Um, it, it, I mean, again, so part of what's very complicated there is whether they are romantic love mm. relationships mm. because that room, the romantic part is, um, its history is bound up in um, a kind of European centric right. uh, conception of mm. the, the, the role that this thing would play relative to the couple and relative to um, monogamous marriage conceived in that historically traditional way as a, um, a way of kind of basically transferring women as property between men from father to husband, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that, that kind of, there's a lot, there's a lot bound up with our ideas of romance. Right. <laughs> it may not be applicable, <laughs> it may not be applicable in other times and places. Um, and, um, but with respect to things like, um, you know, other cultural and religious practices of non-monogamy, um, I think it's absolutely the case that those, those are, um, there's a real and of long standing and right. lots of parts of the world have not done things the way that we do things <laughs> and do not now right um, mm -hmm. it's, um it's absolutely not a universal uh, that um that all humans are are by nature or by default monogamous uh socially monogamous uh, even never mind sexually monogamous mm -hmm. features um one thing that is different about the kind of non-monogamy that I'm primarily talking about here and um, some of these other sorts that you that you're describing um, is that I'm I and this is where some of the feminist philosophy gets in I'm trying to talk about I mean, when I'm talking about like what kinds of change might we want to see I'm trying to get away from patriarchal models so mm -hmm. um, there's a kind of polygamy that is patriarchal polygamy where one man have multiple wives but a woman couldn't have multiple husbands mm -hmm. um, and so patriarchal polygamy is um you know that's another kind of um sexist and misogynistic tradition like patriarchal monogamy um, and there's so it's not really the polygamy or the monogamy that's the problem there it's the patriarchy <laughs> <laughs> so that <laughs> yeah they can't, right. they can't solve that by just getting the monogamy out of the picture oh, yeah. um, so there, uh, there are other ways of understanding non-monogamy that don't require that kind of gendered imbalance. Mm -hmm. um, and so when we talk about contemporary um, situations, we might talk about um, polyamory, mm -hmm. the word that's more, more commonly used than polygamy, but the um, non, non marriage based non uh, gendered um, form of mm -hmm. non monogamous relationship involving a, a romantic type of love <laughs> um, and sometimes people just use the more general term of consensual non-monogamy um, to get away from talking about polygamy that has those connotations of being one man with his multiple wives um, and not the other way around mm -hmm. and and has these associations with um, religious backgrounds mm -hmm. um, that are not um, necessarily required for being a person who practices non-monogamy right? um, so there's a there's a um there's a, a form of non-monogamy that is already quite widespread although um in many places it's um uh it's not it's not as um openly practiced as mm. it it might be if if the world were more tolerant um which is consensual non-monogamy or polyamory um, and those those relationships uh, don't um, have their their roots in um, necessarily in any religious tradition um, or patriarchal are, structure um, they are potentially um, a challenge to patriarchal structures <laughs> in, in, the, in that uh, you know um, so uh, in my situation for example I'm a woman and I'm in more than one relationship mm -hmm. with men right and that is um, potentially a challenge to, to uh, patriarchal conceptions of what a woman should be like. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I, I do get a lot of pushback from, you know, people telling me that I, I'm doing it wrong. This is, this is a bad way to be a woman um, mm -hmm. as a result of, of this fact about me. And it, it's quite different from the kinds of pushback that men would get um, if they were doing this, if they had two female partners. Um, so there's, there's, there's lots of words people call me that you wouldn't call a man, if I can put it that way. <laughs> um, 
So, um, I think I read yeah, that, somewhere. That, yeah. 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 <laughs> so patriarchy is is still is mm. still very present in, right. in these situations, and, and um, but they're um, they are at least not fully structured and determined by certain patriarchal assumptions about what kinds of structure a relationship could have. No, I read but somewhere. Yeah, so I read somewhere an attack against your view in your mm -hmm. lifestyle. So they're saying that it's unnatural, it's immoral, and so on. So how do you respond to those uh, criticisms? So I mean, they, they, these are very different criticisms. So, so some things that are unnatural are great, right? Like I, ibuprofen is really good. <laughs> um, I really like MacBooks. They're, they're not natural. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm less worried about being unnatural, although I do actually think that, you know, as I said earlier, um, non -monogamy, monogamy is natural. Monogamy and yeah. non-monogamy are both natural yeah, for right. humans. Um, but for, on the ethical side of it, I think, um, you know, this is a lot, it's a lot tougher. Um, and I think mm. the, the questions there, I mean, it would take a whole other book to answer what love should be right now, <laughs> although I have some <laughs> opinions about that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, the, but the, the claim that I'm doing something wrong um, is very, it's difficult for me to find any basis for it that doesn't come down to something like, uh, I have a commitment to a, a religious or mm -hmm. other ethical system that you don't share. And then I'm like, well, that's okay. I, I just don't share that. So mm. um, I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> I, don't <laughs> think it's, I don't think it's wrong um, on any grounds that I accept. Mm. Um, and I haven't met anyone who's been able to convince me that it is. So that, yeah, I mean that, it, and then beyond that, it get it really has to get into the specifics of what people are saying is wrong mm -hmm. with what I'm doing. Um, and you know, if, if anyone has specific specific claims about that, I try to answer them. But usually, it's not very specific. It's it's, it's general. Mostly just yeah. General. <laughs> it's just you're yeah. you're bad. <laughs> Yeah, it's premise on religion and it's against the Ten Commandments. Often it's religion. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, the, I, I understand if you have a religious commitment to, to being another mm. way. Mm. Um, uh, but what's actually quite fascinating to me is that a lot of this, a lot of the disapproval doesn't come from religious people necessarily. Um, actually, I'll, I know I'm, I'm good friends with lots of people who are of various religions and very tolerant and open and accepting people and it's, mm. it's, it's um the the i only mention religious reasons for thinking i'm doing something wrong because i i those are the only ones that make any sense to me right a lot of <laughs> a lot of the disapproval that i get it's just like well it's just icky and yucky and, gross. and well i don't think so uh, it, doesn't, uh -huh. it doesn't seem that way to me and like why why do you think it is and then it it, it tends to be i think more motivated by uh, feelings people have mm -hmm. uh, necessarily rational arguments that they have worked through carefully okay so where do you see the philosophy of love heading given our discussion so far i would hope um that it will start to broaden and diversify so mm -hmm. i would like to see more work on um different questions about different kinds of love um, so not just more of the same old story, um, the boy meets girl story, mm -hmm. um, and the same old questions about that, like are they being rational in loving one another? Um, like I said, those are good questions, but I think there's so much more that we can ask. And our, our world is a very exciting place, and in mm -hmm. some ways not, not a great thing, but some ways it, it's good. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> And romantic love, especially, is one of these things that has been super exciting mm. from a philosophical point of view for the last, at least the last 20, 30 years. Um, and I, I would like to see the philosophy of love really kind of come and bring to bear all of its strategies and, and um, power of thought and argumentation and theorizing mm. and idea generating in mm -hmm. those areas where it can really kind of make a difference not that it has to stop doing the other stuff like those are also great questions but like i think there's so much scope there's so much potential um 
And so I, I think I would love it if more philosophers of love were, um, so, so, you know, uh, able to speak to different concerns. Like I, one that I, I've noticed coming to the front again and again recently is um, the, the difference between romantic love and a sexual relationship. So, mm -hmm. um, so much of the philosophy of love has kind of just straight up conflated the two. Um, mm -hmm. That it's, you know, when I look at it, it's very striking. It's just an assumption that if you're in a romantic relationship, you're having sex with the person. If you're having sex with the person, you're interested in romantic relationships. And it's just like, well, hang on a second. What about, <laughs> what about people who don't have sex? What about people who have casual sex? That mm -hmm. is a lot of people, right? What about people who have friends with benefits? And th mm -hmm. there are all these other kinds of configurations of, of loving relationships and of sexual relationships. And those sometimes overlap and sometimes don't. Um, and there's, there's actually really good philosophical work to be done charting this rich, complicated territory. But for whatever reason, the philosophy of love has kind of gotten caught up with a quite traditional, a, a yeah. traditional model. And I, I think it's time. It's time for us to, to look at more than just that. And, and you know, to, to the extent that there's really, you know, an ethical argument against being a polyamorous woman, let's say, they should bring it. They, 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 <laughs> if there's one out there, I'd love uh -huh. to see that published in a journal and made really kind of um, clear and explicit so that I could respond to it. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing would be, would be interesting. I would probably be, you know, hurt and angry as well, but at least there'd be something I could, <laughs> that, right? If people are just like, oh, I, th I, don't, I don't think it's right. That's not good. Mm -hmm. that, there's not much I can do about that, right? I can't, I don't know how to, how to respond to, to that kind of, it's just a feeling mm. that I have. Um, so, and, so, and I mean, like I said, I'm, I'm just one person with one perspective and there, there's such a rich and, and um, diverse range of, of stuff and perspectives and people and experiences that <laughs> I, I would love to see entering the philosophy of love as a discussion, not okay. just old white men. <laughs> <laughs> like Roger Scruton. Oh, never mind. <laughs> I wasn't, wasn't going to say <laughs> I'll edit that out. Okay, so on a more professional note, what's your advice for those who want to get into academic professional philosophy? Ooh, um, there are still people who want to do that. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, the, the, one thing that, the one thing that I would say is it's important to know what that means what it really is like to mm -hmm. be a professional academic philosopher now um and because i didn't know at all um, honestly i i loved the subject matter the discipline and, and i loved the kinds of writing that i was reading and i wanted to get into that but i didn't really know what it meant to work in a university i had no idea what academic admin is like and how much of it there is and i had no idea like how what the the kind of um the zeitgeist was going to be like. And, um, you know, when I was a uh, graduate student uh, in, um, in Cambridge, I asked one of my mentors, you know, what's it like to be a woman in philosophy? Because she was one of the few senior women that, that mm. were around. And, and um, she told me there was no discrimination anymore in, in terms of gender in, mm -hmm. in philosophy. And I said, oh, that's great. And, and then so <laughs> that's not turned out to be my experience and so I was I was sort of I was a little bit clueless and, and I felt a bit misled by some of this um, mm -hmm. I think what she meant was that it's not explicit anymore it's no longer, <laughs> people will no longer come out to you and say you can't do that because you're a woman um, uh -huh. but they'll there's still a lot of ways in which those prejudices continue just under under the surface mm -hmm. in people's assumptions and biases and what it actually feels like to go into a conference as a woman um, and find yourself in another room full of old white men who are, you know, if they're interested in you at all, it's potentially not for reasons that have to do with your brilliant ideas. And mm -hmm. th that kind of thing, I, I didn't know what it would be like in that way. Um, and I, I think there are lots of other kinds of nasty shocks that different people encounter when they enter the academic space that, um, 
yeah so I think I think I mean my main piece of advice for people who who really want to get into this is to really know what they're getting into mm -hmm. because there's a there's an image of being an academic that maybe comes from a different era uh, mm -hmm. where it's very pure and people are out of the world and they sit in their ivory tower and they have very well-mannered and deep conversations with one another and that's not the life <laughs> um, I have come to know at okay. academia. <laughs> right. um, and you're um, from Trinity College, Cambridge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. And I mean, even there, it wasn't like that. <laughs> it, uh, it was more like that. <laughs> I had heard stories, yes. <laughs> yeah, but but it, no, it, it was not. Um, mm -hmm. It was not that at all. And so it's it's important to kind of. Uh, and I mean, the only way to, to find this out is to ask people mm -hmm. um, and hope that they tell you the truth. Um, <laughs> because uh, uh, with the best will in the world, some people don't tell you the truth because they don't know the truth. Mm. Uh, not everybody knows what it's like. You know, I, I don't know what it's like to be, um, you know, a black woman in a room full of old white men philosophers at a conference. And I, I can't speak to that um, because it's not been my experience. But mm. um, for people who are getting into the discipline now, I think it's just important to get as many perspectives as possible, um, including from the people who aren't usually the loudest about mm. this, um, this kind of thing, um, to really know what it means. And, you know, that, that sounds like I'm being terribly pe pessimistic and off-putting, um, but in a way, I kind of, I kind of want to be, because uh, um, I'm, I'm a little pessimistic about the state of academia at the moment. Honestly, I think we're in a, a little bit of a crisis stage. Mm -hmm. in the all over the world. of the university. Yeah, yeah, yeah. all over the yeah. world. Mm. Yeah. So I, I don't think it's the kind of security that it used to be. I don't think it's the kind of life that it is <laughs> sometimes <laughs> depicted as being. Um, and you know, mm. there are still lots of good reasons to do it, but you have to know, you have to know it. You have to know mm. what it is to choose it. <laughs> make, make an informed choice. <laughs> right. Okay, but is your career worth it? I think it might be. Um, I had a, actually, I was thinking about this question because you gave me your questions in advance, and I was thinking about this word um, or phrase, job crafting. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, um, it's, it's out of actually um, uh, this stuff, this, this research is being done by someone who's in a school of, um, business or management or something like that, not a philosopher, um, mm -hmm. but I find her, her way of thinking about career fascinating. So job crafting, um, her name is Amy and I'm going to mispronounce her second name because I don't know how to pronounce it, but it, it, it looks to me like Wisniewski. Mm -hmm. um, and her theory <laughs> is that people who craft their job um, are a lot more satisfied in mm -hmm. their work and they stay in the job longer and they find it more meaningful and all that. So they flourish more. Mm. Um, eudaimonia in, in philosophical terms is what <laughs> I think she's talking about. Uh -huh. and, and what job crafting means is that you don't just sort of take the job description as is, as an mm. external you know, thing that you have to conform to, um, but instead you kind of shape it more into what you would want the job to be. Mm. Um, so the, the further I get through my career, the more job crafting I'm trying to do. Um, and that includes things like, you know, writing this book that was not a conventional monograph. Um, mm -hmm. And now I'm starting to do more in this direction. I'm, I'm, a lot of my work now is in creative writing um, yeah. forms. My, my last book was, was book of poetry, collaboration <laughs> with a historian. And um, so this, this stuff is, is not the stuff I was trained into. So it's not oh. the job I was handed, but it's the job I want. It's the kind of thing I thought I might be able to do if I became a philosopher. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of trying to reshape the job into that. And I think that, you know, um, I, I think that when I say that I feel like my career could be worth it, it's because I'm able to do that. I'm, I'm lucky. I'm, I'm one of the lucky few in a tenured um, uh, professorship at a, a good university, um, you know, that, that mm -hmm. makes it possible for me to do these kinds of things. Um, and I think, you know, it's a little bit like when I was talking about... Um, the responsibility we have to kind of reshape the story of what love is. Uh, I actually feel the same way about 
our responsibility or my responsibility to to contribute to shaping the story about what a philosophy professor is mm -hmm. um, and so that means um you know being willing to do kinds of work that look more like <laughs> what i would hope a philosophy professor might be able to do um, even if that does backfire in some ways and you know i i got hate mail for, for, for this book and for lots of the other stuff that, that i've been doing mm -hmm. um, i don't get um necessarily um not all the work i do is necessarily regarded as being real philosophy in certain circles um uh, but i'm okay with that <laughs> um, and to, to me the important thing is the the, the elements of um the element of job crafting and the responsibility to make the the story going forward to have the influence that i want to have on that um, so it's kind of um yeah i i think it's worth it if i can do that um, I'm, I'm gonna keep trying to the extent that i can sometimes i use that i don't think i mentioned this but i i don't like the word interdisciplinary even though a lot of the work i now do would fall under the heading of interdisciplinary work mm -hmm. but i do like the the word undisciplined for it so i think like getting out of the, <laughs> yeah, getting, <laughs> getting out of the discipline of philosophy i like that the, kind of, right? <laughs> the kinds of constraints mm. that tell you you have to write this kind of article for mm. this kind of journal mm. and achieve this kind of result and if you don't do that it's not real philosophy mm -hmm. i am quite resistant to that thought um, and so i'm trying to un undiscipline the discipline. undiscipline yourself <laughs> i like that okay so on that note thanks again professor jenkins for sharing your time with us for you guys join me again for another episode of philosophy and what matters where we discuss things that matter from a philosophical point of view cheers <laughs>